Good morning, everybody. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and stand with me. We're going to open up with Psalm chapter 1. And make sure, make sure you know, you bend your knees. We're going to read the whole book of Psalms. We ready? Just kidding. Psalm chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. It says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. This part right here. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let me pray for us and we'll begin. Father, I thank you for this morning, uh, a morning when we can look at the importance of your word. And so God, as we sing now, um, God, let everything we say, let everything we do this, this morning be directed for your glory uh, and your glory alone. God, these, these songs um, that have maybe even been sung multiple times, let them be as new truths to our hearts. Uh, pointing to you, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Living Hope. My name is Jeannie Greenman and these are the ways that you can get involved with our church. Our real leadership meeting is coming February 3rd at 9 a.m. If you are involved in any of our ministries, you won't want to miss it, so be there. Do you need some help around the house? Ren a Teen is coming up on February 3rd. You can sign up for youth to come over and help you with anything you need done in the foyer today. Our men's ministry kickoff will be on February 10th at 6 p.m. Hope to see you men there. The men will also begin meeting at Denny's for breakfast starting February 14th. Stay tuned for details. Are you not part of a small group yet? It's really important to your spiritual growth to be involved with other believers in a deep Bible study. So look for more information with the welcome team or on the video slides in the foyer. The cold weather is on us, so grab your giving blanket in our online shop today. Just as the name suggests, the goal is to give the blanket away to someone in need. The proceeds from your purchase go towards repairing the church floors. Here at Living Hope, we believe in taking the next steps in our spiritual walk. We want to help you do that. If you are new to our church or you haven't given us any information about you and you're just kind of looking around, we would love to get to know you better. You can scan the welcome code on the back of the seat in front of you, or you can visit the welcome center on your way out. If you've been coming for a while, we would love for you to scan the serve code and a leader will contact you about one of our ministries that you're interested in. To financially support Living Hope, you can either scan the gift code or drop your tithes and offerings in the boxes at the back of the sanctuary after the service. You can also visit our church website. We're really glad that you joined us here at Living Hope. Enjoy the service and have a great week. Amen, everybody. Here's number one. This is Michael Morales. <laughs> Michael, have you professed Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I profess him as my Lord and Savior. Upon your profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? Yeah. Just, just so you know, uh, after that last week, before I got from here to the youth room, I had three other people stop me about baptism. So we're going to have more of those happening. Amen? Isn't that awesome? <laughs> yeah. We actually have to keep the baptistry filled, which is a good thing. Uh, well, hey, uh, this morning, if you have your Bibles, uh, open with me to Matthew chapter 7. If not, this is a great message because we're talking all about Scripture and so please, please hear me. If you uh, do not have a copy uh, of the, a, a physical copy, not a digital copy, but if you don't have a physical copy of God's Word, please let us know. We don't want anybody uh, to go without that, especially with what, you're talk what we're talking about this morning. Um, and I'm not going to lie, when I originally looked at the sermon calendar and I saw that I was preaching this morning, uh, I read this passage and I thought, oh, goody, I get to talk with you all about heresy. <clears throat> 
which is not something that is like overly exciting to talk about, right? Um, but as I did more study, I kind of had this idea of where I thought that this message would go, and God constantly changed it, which is why I have this massive stack of literature next to me. And actually, this could be bigger, but I realized I couldn't carry it in here, and I was going to have to carry it out of here. So I'll talk about what all this is here in a little bit. Um, but uh, what we're talking about this morning is Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 15. Let me read that for us. Um, and if you are willing and able uh, to stand with me as we read God's word, we're going to start in verse 15. It says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. <clears throat> a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, and, uh, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Father, I thank you for this morning. Um, as we look at uh, your word and, and really um, the importance of not just reading it, but studying it and delighting in it and, and, and dwelling with you in your word. God, uh, let us hear from you this morning. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So you can may be seated. Thank you so much. So we're talking about letting your guard down. And uh, as, as a few of you know, um, I was in the best military branch, and that's the Marine Corps. Um, there's back there. Uh, I got a boo up here, and I got a back there. That's how you know there's a Marine back there. Um, uh, thank you, Sergeant Major. But uh, so uh, letting your guard down. Uh, let, right after boot camp, uh, they give you a little bit of time to be with your family, and then you think you're done after 13 weeks of training, and they say, that's funny, you're not. And you get to go right back for four more. Uh, and that is called MCT, Marine Combat Training. And it was in that uh, that I had a combat instructor named Sergeant Ramirez. Sergeant Ramirez um, is uh, what you would picture. I'm not what you would picture a, 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 a man looking like, right? Uh, I'm, I'm smaller. Uh, this guy, this was your, your picture of a man. He was, he, I mean, I think his forearms were probably bigger than my head. Uh, this guy was massive. He had been in combat multiple times, and he was going to lead all of us little Marines uh, that were just barely four months old in combat training. And one of the things that he actually told us was, this was to never let your guard down. And actually, this, the saying that we had uh, was complacency kills. Um, and that's not just something that we use in the Marine Corps. That's something that you use in every branch. That the second you let your guard down, uh, that's when someone can sneak up on you and take advantage of that. And uh, we learned this technique called popping a corner. Uh, and I know that might sound strange to you, but basically, uh, when you're going through and checking buildings and things like that, as you walk by windows, as you walk by doors, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to pop the corner. What that means is when you come up to the doorway, you short barrel your rifle and you pop the corner like this to make sure that there's nobody there. And you're supposed to remember that because we use these rifles that are called M16s and the very front of them, now they use something smaller, but the, the front of these things was, was probably about a foot and a half to two feet long. It's just this massive barrel that sticks off the front of this rifle. And the reason why they wanted you to short barrel it and pop the corner was because if you came walking around a corner and someone was there, the barrel of your rifle would get into that room long before you ever did. And unfortunately, there came a day where we were supposed to be trying to go through what's called a mount town. Mount stands for movement on urban terrain. We were supposed to go through this and start practicing clearing these rooms. And so we go, and I've got my room assignment, and what do I do? I come right in there with my rifle, and I have my rifle up. I remember that part. You never put it down. I have my rifle up, and I come around that corner. And do you think I remember to pop? Do not remember to pop. And uh, y'all, I don't know if you've ever heard a, gr a grown man scream. But I came around that corner and I went like this and Sergeant Ramirez was right behind that door. And he was waiting for me and he grabbed the front of my rifle and started shaking it like this. And by the way, I didn't know anybody was actually in these rooms. I thought we were just kind of going through the motions like, oh, we, you know, we're just like playing a little game. Oh, man, lo and behold... Everything that I had for breakfast almost came out. It was, not, it was not very good. It was terrifying. And what was his lesson? He started shaking my rifle, and he's saying, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead, right? And what had happened in that moment? I became complacent. 
I became comfortable thinking that nothing was going to happen. And when I forgot those things that I was supposed to do that had been drilled in my head for a long time, the second I let my guard down, I was attacked. And that's what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about letting your guard down because what does it say right there from the beginning? It says, be on your guard. Beware of false prophets. Be on your guard. And if your Bible has that word guard, that's actually the Greek word prosecco. And it means this. It means to pay attention to and be cautious about. Okay? Uh, That's the same word beware. All right? And so what does that mean? There's two parts to that word. Okay? It's pay attention to or be informed and then be cautious about. Be on the lookout. Two pieces. Because here's the reality, that when we see be on your guard or beware, what we like to do is we like to just put up walls and we think, if I can just isolate myself and I only wrap myself around, you know, the only thing that I watch is the Left Behind series and the only thing I have in my house playing is is worship music and I I can just isolate myself and I can stay away from everything else that I'm going to be okay. Uh, But I'm here to tell you that that's not true. Because this isn't talking about some enemy that's just out there that we can block out. What we're talking about is a spiritual enemy. And if you know, there was a man named Jerome, uh, very famously known for, for translating the Bible into Latin. He thought the same thing. And he said, obviously, if there are temptations, what am I going to do? He went out into the middle of the desert, and he lived in caves. And in his writings, he actually said that he still, even though he was by himself, out there in the wilderness, in a cave, not close to anybody or anything, he still, in his words, had visions of dancing women. And so what we're talking about is not something that we can physically protect ourselves necessarily. What we're talking about is something that is spiritual, being on your guard spiritually. And so what does that first part mean? The first part says, be informed, okay? This goes beyond blocking it out, okay? You have to know about your enemy because they're going to use strange tactics. I am a football fan. I love watching football. Um, I'm not going to lie. It was kind of sad yesterday to see the Packers lose. I'm sorry. Um, Never been a 49ers fan in my life, all right? Um, But when you watch football, uh, they don't just kind of show up to the game, right? It doesn't matter what sport it is. I'm a tennis player. Um, it doesn't matter if it's tennis or rugby or, or whatever it may be. You don't just kind of show up there and the coach says, all right, everybody, um, we're just going just to kind of run around. Somebody get open, right? That's what backyard football is. Every play is a Hail Mary. Just, just get open, right? That, and, and whenever I play football um, with the students, that's kind of the plan. Like, oh, Pastor Tim, I'm going to run down there. Just get, I'm going to get open. Just watch for me. And I'm like, okay. What a plan, right? Like, that's a great strategy. What do they typically do? They spend hours upon hours upon hours reviewing film. It does not matter what the sport is, whether it's basketball or baseball or whatever it may be. You spend hours upon hours reviewing film. Why? Because you want to know your enemy's tactics. You want to know who the key players are. You want to know what kind of plays that they do, especially if they run special plays where they try and trick you, right? Uh, They they throw different looks at you. They they, they switch things up. Uh, One of the coolest things I've ever ever seen was a a football play called the Statue of Liberty. And it threw off me. It threw off the cameraman that was trying to, to televise this football game because what happened? They hiked the ball and they just kind of snuck the ball to somebody that was running behind the quarterback, and he was off to the races, right? They're trying to trick you. They're good at what they do. And so what this is talking about is pay attention. You have to know your enemy to understand how they're going to attack you. And I know that that sounds strange here in church, right? Because what are we talking about? We're talking about a spiritual problem, and here I am telling you to make sure that you are informed about all of the things you're not supposed to do. Make sure that you're informed about all of the heresies, which is one thing that we're going to be talking about this morning. Know them. Know about all the other religions. Learn about Mormonism. Learn about Islam. Why? Not so that way you can become a student of those things, but because those are all tactics of the enemy. And ignorance is the best way for us to be complacent. Okay? And so that's the first thing, is we have to be informed. 
the best uh, offense is a really, sorry, the best defense is a really good offense. The second thing is that we need to be on the lookout. And most of the time, this is what gets us in trouble. Just like me, when I was in combat training, I was not on the lookout. I was not thinking there was an enemy there. And maybe that's, maybe that's some of you this morning that you think, oh, it's not that bad, right? Uh, we're, we're not talking about this heresy this morning, uh, but there's a heresy called universalism. Like, ah, oh, don't worry about it. Everybody's just going to end up in heaven anyways. There's no real enemy. We're all just, we always got to love each other, right? And we end up with this, with this really lazy faith because we don't think that there's an enemy there. And so we have to be on the lookout. And what this means is that you're not falling asleep on your watch. What this means is that you're actively engaged. And here's what's, what's, what's funny. If you look at the tone of what we just read, this is not saying be ready to attack. This is saying be ready to be attacked. That's why we're on the lookout. We're not on the lookout because we just got to go punch the world in the face with, with Scripture. What we actually are, are being told to be ready for is to be attacked. It's a guarantee. The attacks will come. One of my favorite passages in Scripture is John chapter 17. And, and just as a side note, John chapter 17 is Jesus' prayer the night before he was going to be killed on the cross. And if you ever want to be encouraged, if you ever want to wonder what we're supposed to be doing in life, if you're ever having a hard day, make it a discipline to just read John chapter 17. Because that is Jesus' prayer to you. And I love that, that actually in, in John chapter 17, part of his prayer, he's actually talking about his disciples, but then he clarifies. This is one of the most encouraging parts for you, is that it says, I don't just pray for these, but I pray for those that they will lead to you in my name. What that means is you. You are here. You're sitting in this room. You are a Christian today because of the ministry of the original apostles, of the original disciples. And Jesus in that prayer said, I'm praying for all the people that will be in their lineage of evangelism and grace. It's an encouraging thing. We have to be on the lookout. And in that prayer, Jesus says what? I do not ask that you, that, that you remove them from this world, but I ask that you protect them from the evil one. Why do we need protecting? What we're talking about is today, today is because the attacks will come. That lies and deceit and hurt, everything, all of that is a guarantee in your life. And I was actually, uh, the guy that was baptized uh, this past uh, Sunday, his name is Michael, I was talking with him, and, and he was talking to me about how he just kind of feels spiritually attacked. And let me, let me tell you this, if you don't feel like you're spiritually attacked, that's when you need to be concerned. Because what that means is that Satan doesn't think you're a threat. Going back to that football analogy, when we review film and we're looking at all of that, who do they double team? They double team the people, double team and triple team the people that are a threat. Do you think that if I walked out there and they said, I won a contest and I get to play in the Super Bowl, do you think the other team is going to double and triple team me? No, probably not. I'll just be like, hey guys, just make sure I don't die out there. That'd be great, right? Like that was my tactic. Who are they double teaming and triple teaming? the ones that are the threats. So naturally, if you're doing what you're supposed to do, you're probably going to be attacked even more, which is why you need to be even more on your guard, even more on the lookout. Because here's why. Remember that the devil is cunning. Most of the time, we seem to think that spiritual attacks are going to be like what we see in the movies, where it's just theatrical and huge and and somebody's eyes roll back on their head and they start floating through the air and, and you wake up in the morning and all of, your, all of your, your dining room table chairs are upside down and hanging from the ceiling and you're like, oh, spiritual attack. That's not what it, it normally looks like. What, what we have to realize is that the devil is cunning. He's good at what he does. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And when I read that passage, that word looking stood out to me. By the way, what I'm about to do, today is going to be very practical, okay? All right? Uh, looking. When I, when I use uh, some of these books to figure out what that word was, uh, in the Greek, it actually means walking to make due use of opportunity. Walking to make due use of opportunity. 
Here's the thing about lions. I don't know if you've ever seen The Lion King. I'm a Disney fan, okay? Here's, yeah, used to be. Here's the thing uh, in, in Lion King, when, when, uh, when little Simba is learning how to pounce. There's this part where the bird guy is talking, and all of a sudden he's told to turn around. And, and Mufasa is going to teach Simba how to pounce. And what happens uh, when he turns back around? He starts saying, hello? Are you there? He has no idea where they are. And all of a sudden, what, what happens out of nowhere? He gets pounced on. He gets tackled by little Simba, who's learning. That's how a lion works, that you don't see them, that they're hiding in the brush, that they're very intentional with each step, that they're cunning, that they're smart with every sound that they make. And before you know it, you're snatched up. He's not a roaring lion. He's a prowling lion. And he's sneaking around. But even more than that, he's looking for opportunities. That every little opportunity that he can take, he's going to take advantage of to make you feel more depressed, to make you feel more anxious, to push you further and further away. And here's the thing, uh, before, before we get into this, should we as Christians be worried about being um, possessed by demons? No. But that does not mean you can't be attacked. And the best attack can be to convince you, maybe they lost you, right? Maybe you're going off to heaven, and they realize that they, 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 can't, they can't get you to come with them um, down to hell, right? Maybe that's the reality. But the best thing that they can do at that point, they can absolutely attack you so that way you don't lead anybody else to faith. You're going to be attacked whether you're a Christian or not. And the more on fire you are, the more attack you're going to feel. Even Paul said that I have a thorn in my side. I have a thorn in my flesh. It's going to happen. The more faithful we are. This is why, and we're going to talk about this later, this is why your best defense is a good offense. What we're talking about this morning is all about defense, being ready to defend. Those attacks are going to come. Uh, the, the armor of God talks about flaming darts that are going to come at us. That we are going to be attacked, okay? Okay. And then I also want to say this as well, because before we get going here, what are we talking about? We're talking about fruit, all right? We have to remember this. As we read this passage, everything produces fruit. Did you guys catch that? In verse 17, let me read this verse again. It says this, So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A lot of times we like to think that you only produce fruit <clears throat> if you're following the Spirit, and it's spiritual fruit. Jesus teaches right here that that's not the case. Everything produces fruit. And what's the number one thing, the only thing in this passage that he repeats, that he says twice, if you look at verse 20, you will recognize them by their fruits. So as we're on the guard, as we're looking around, as we're trying to be informed, what are we looking for? We're looking for the fruit that those things produce. Are we with me so far? So not only are we on the guard, not, o- not only are we getting out there, not only are we looking for those attacks, not only are we understanding that we're not going to see the attack coming, that it's going to be creative, that it's going to be unique, we also have to remember that the way we can recognize it is what does Jesus say? By its fruit. And what is that fruit? Good or bad? What's interesting is the last time I got to preach here, we talked about light. And whatever is inside determines what fruit we bear. We remember that the, 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 the eye is the lamp of the body. And what we were talking about is, is, is if you're angled toward the light, light will come into you, and that will, be, that will determine the type of fruit that you produce, if you all remember that. And obviously, if we turn away from that light, darkness fills the body, and what does it produce? It produces bad fruit. So naturally, as we angle ourselves toward the Spirit, as we consume as much of Scripture as we can, we are bringing light into our body, and that ultimately affects what? The fruit that we bear. If nothing but darkness is filling our bodies, what is that going to ultimately affect? It is ultimately going to affect the fruit that we produce. They're either the fruits of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Right? Galatians chapter 5. But I want to read you another passage, and this might seem harsh, but turn with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 1. What are the other fruits? And when I think of a list of 
non-spiritual fruit or bad fruit, this is a passage that comes to my mind. Maybe a different one comes to your mind. But if we're looking at bad fruits that we're supposed to be aware of, check this out in Romans chapter 1. This is Paul talking about um, some of the things that the Romans are experiencing. And he starts off in verse 28. And he says this, Since they did not see, to, see, see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not be done. Check this out in verse 29. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And that may seem harsh, but that's the list you don't want to memorize and apply to your life. Like, I don't think when we get up to heaven and if they say, well, well tell me about what you did in your life, you, you probably don't want to say, oh, I was, I was full of all manners of unrighteousness. I was evil. I was covetousness. I was full of malice and envy and strife. Right? Those aren't the things that we want coming off of us. But what do you notice Paul's saying is, is these people had that coming off of them and then they were giving approval to others to practice them as well. That that is the fruit that we are looking for. That outwardly, what do they look like? They look like sheep. It looks okay, but then when you look at the fruit that they are producing, those are the things that we need to be aware of. It may seem harsh, but we have to remember is that we are either on God's side or we are not. When we talked about light, you either have light coming into you or you don't. There's no middle. We're actually, uh, with the students, we're in a series on Joshua right now, and there's a moment where they're about to go to Jericho, and Joshua is scouting out Jericho, and a man stops him, who we know is, as, as Jesus, the second member of the, of the Trinity. man stops him and says, what are you doing? And he approaches him, and what does Joshua say to the man? Are you for us or for our enemies? And I love his response. He says, no. He doesn't say neither. What does he say? No. I am for the Lord. And what he was saying was, no, that's the wrong question. It's not about getting God on your side. It is about getting on God's side. You are either for me or you are against me. Matthew 12, 30. Whoever is not with me is against me. It is either or. Well, but my friend, he doesn't come to church, but he's a really nice guy. You are either for me or you are against me. That he might look like a nice guy, but the reasons behind it, the fruit that it's producing, is not spiritually focused. You are either for me or against me. That as we're looking, those are the two categories. Either you're bearing fruit against God or you're bearing spiritual fruit, period. Either you have light or you don't. You know what Revelation says about being lukewarm in the middle? You're vomited from the mouth of God. There is no middle. And when we talk about the kingdom of God, when we talk about scripture, when we talk about um, what we're trying to be as a church, you can't be in the middle. Because people in the middle, that you're not productive. You're not moving anything forward. You've got to get up off your seat and you've got to get moving. You are either for him or against him. Period. And I know that might seem harsh, but I'm going to put it to you the way that I put this to the students, because maybe, maybe you haven't been coming to church for a while. Maybe you're still kind of questioning this. I'm not ignorant. I'm, I've been a pastor for a while. I know that not everybody that comes to church weekly on a weekly basis is a Christian. In fact, Matthew, chap Matthew chapter 7 also teaches that, that not all who cry, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Some of us are really good at putting on sheep's clothing. I know that not all of us are on this train, but we have to remember that at the end of time, you're not saved by your parents' faith. You're not saved by your grandparents' faith. You are not saved by your church attendance. You are saved by declaring Jesus as Lord, and you have to realize what that means that when you declare Jesus as Lord, you abandon your ways and your understanding, 
Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And you say, I want your path. You make my path straight. I'll follow wherever you want to go. How do we know that? Scripture. Remember, Jesus was, was pointing us to what we were supposed to study and look to day in and day out, like the passage that I read right at the beginning when we got in here. His delight is on the law of the Lord, and he meditates on it day and night. And what does that lead to? You're like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. That you're able to look through all the chaos of life and remember what actually matters. You have an eternal perspective because of Scripture. And so this morning, we're looking at heresies, but in reality, this is a message on Scripture, on dedicating, on, on, on meditating, on, on studying Scripture. Why? Because your best defense is a good offense. And so what are we looking for? What are, what are those things that we're supposed to be aware of? They're heresies, okay? And this is what we're talking about, heresy. All right? Now, uh, what is a heresy? And this is where I need to clarify some things, okay? Uh, here's what a heresy, here's the definition of heresy. Ready? Belief or opinion contrary to orthodox religious doctrine. Hmm. What a sentence. Let me clarify what that means. When it says orthodox, that means established, original, okay? True. Religious doctrine, doctrine would be core beliefs, okay? Now, here's what we have to be careful of. Before we get started, as I say heresy, you're already thinking about things, okay? We have to be very careful what we call heresy, okay? The fact that I'm wearing jeans to preach is not a heresy, I hear some giggles, but I also have some people, maybe they're like, I don't know about that. The color that we paint the walls is not heresy. How loud the music is is not heresy. We have to be very careful with what we call heresy. How do we know what, when something becomes a heresy? It is when it violates a hill to die on. If Scripture is 195,000% clear on what is and is not, if it violates that, that is a heresy. If it violates one of our core doctrines, how you become a Christian, the doctrine of salvation. Right, we're going to look at, at, a, at, a, uh, at one heresy. I'm going to give you an example of how to do this today. But legalism says that you can work your way to salvation. Why is that a heresy? Because that violates the doctrine of salvation that we have proof of where? Scripture. And it is therefore a heresy. If it violates that, that core doctrine, it needs to be a heresy. And so here's the reality. You have to know the truth in order to determine what is false. Otherwise, what are you acting on? Opinion. And that's where all this goes south. Well, I'm going to give you an example of how to do this with one heresy today that follows that opinion, that it's born out of opinion. Well, my God would never do that. Well, where are you getting that from? It cannot come from your opinion. It can only come from the truths of Scripture. And this is where we have to have the lens in the right place. That I don't hold the Bible here and use the lens of my opinions and my plan to look at Scripture. Because what that does is I'm going to read whatever I want to happen into my Bible. And I'm going to look for anything I can to justify it. And we're going to see that today. Instead, we need to use Scripture as the lens to interpret everything that we do in our lives. The problem is we have a blurry lens. That we don't actually even know what the Bible says to begin with. And this is actually why we're going through some of the series that we are with the students. We're going through a series uh, called um, Key Players. And we've been in this series for months, and it's actually a series of mini-series where we're actually looking at all of these Bible characters that maybe we saw on VeggieTales, but we've never actually studied their stories. That I just had a, a conversation with my daughter because she asked me about Noah's Ark. And I said, that's actually one of the scariest stories in the Bible. And she said, no. It's about animals. 
that, we, that that happens, that, that we don't even really know these stories, right? And so what happens is they become cute and cuddly. That when we look at Jesus being described as a lamb, we think that that means he's cute and cuddly, when in reality, the picture of a lamb has nothing to do with his demeanor. It has everything to do with the quality of his sacrifice. He's also the roaring of the lion of Judah. And how do you know that? Scripture. That if you do not know the truth, you will fall every time to your opinion, to the tactics of the devil. And you'll never see it coming. Why? Because you have no way of interpreting it. That if it sounds good, you'll go with it every time. These heresies, they're, they're tactical. They're, they make sense, right? Uh, I want to point you to this. We actually have a, a slide, uh, I think. There it is, cool. Uh, this is actually from our website. I, <clears throat> I'm a web designer, and I don't think that websites should be used for information. In fact, when we launched our new website for our church, I actually told you guys that, that I wanted our, our website to be a tool, something that you can use. And we're actually building that up even more, as I'll talk about here in a little bit. But one of the great tools that you can have is this little section, what we believe. If you go to our website and you hover over the about, you'll see what we believe. You click on that. All of these little plus signs extend, and it'll tell you what we believe about Scripture, what we believe about salvation, what we believe about the Holy Spirit. And it gives you passages of Scripture of why we believe that, that it's not our opinion. It's based on this scriptural truth. And why is this a good tool for you to use? Because again, you cannot know what is false unless you know what is true. What's the earliest entry point? Look at any of this. I tell our students all the time, when you're looking at a church to go to in the future, and you graduate, and you go off to college, or you have your own life, and you, and you move on, how do you know whether or not it's a good church? It's not by the sound of, they've got a really cool um, band place. Their pastor, he wears skinny jeans in this nice little leather jacket thing. He looks really cool. Oh man, 1,500 people attend there every Sunday. Like, none of that matters. What matters? What is their core belief? Here's the telltale sign. If you cannot find what they believe, don't go there. You will know the truth, and that will set you free. Why? Because it helps you understand and interpret life that it gives you the lens to interpret everything, and you can identify a heresy. Like, that is false. That is wrong. Why? Because I know the truth well. I meditate on it day and night. That I can live and flourish like a tree planted by streams of water. Why? Because falsehood can't affect me if I know the truth. And ultimately, what happens when you know the truth, too? It mobilizes you. That we don't have to convince you to serve by the way, Moses, Noah, Joshua, Paul, none of these people were young when they were doing what God was calling them to do. Noah had multiple hundreds of years, and he was still doing what God was calling him to do. You're not done ever. And when you read Scripture, you realize that. We have to grasp this. And so I want to give you an example of how we do this today. Because again, how do we do this? 1 Thessalonians 5 talks about how we're supposed to test everything. Even what I'm saying to you today, you're supposed to test it. How do you test it? I want to give you a way of doing this. Because again, we're supposed to be aware of these things. We need to be aware of these wolves that are coming in sheep's clothing. So, so what is something practically a tool that I can give to you? You have to ask these four questions. Number one, what are they teaching? That when you evaluate everything that comes to you, what is it teaching? What is it? What's their message? Okay. The second question, why so sheepish? And here's what that question means. Why does it look like a sheep? What's so appealing about it? Okay. But then the second thing, why so serious? What in reality could make this a ravenous wolf? Why does it look appealing but why is it so serious? And here's how you answer that question. What fruit is it producing? That as we evaluate and we look at the fruit that that would produce, that is what could reveal to us whether or not it is actually a sheep or it is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Again, 
What is the only thing that Jesus repeated in this passage? You will know it by its fruit. So we have to be able to look at the fruit, okay? So I'm going to use one heresy. This is actually a heresy. I'm going to use one heresy to show you how we do this. Are we with me? All right, we're going to get practical, okay? I'm, I'm giving you tools. It's up to you whether or not you use them, all right? Number one, the very first one that comes to my mind is the prosperity gospel. This is the health and wealth gospel. It is very popular in the United States and the Western world, Western Europe, okay? These more established places. So what are they teaching? Remember, that's the first question. What does it teach? This teaches that the more we give and pray, the more we receive, okay? That sounds pretty great, right? It sounds like a good tactic of getting more people to give to the church, and how could that be bad, right? Well, uh, they use a lot of passages. Luke chapter 6, verse 38 uh, John chapter, uh, 3 John 1, verse 2, uh, Malachi 3, 8 through 10. Let me just show you one. Uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 38 says this. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. That's one example of a passage that they use to justify this belief. Okay. Now, what do you notice about that? It is one verse amongst thousands. Okay? That should be a telltale sign, a red light blinking in your brain that I believe this because of this one verse that I saw in Hobby Lobby. The light should flash. You know the best thing to interpret Scripture with? Scripture. The best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. Well, I don't know how to read the Bible. That's what I'm going to talk about these four. Okay? Why is it heresy? It violates countless passages of Scripture. And I started to list them, and then I realized we, we would have to take an intermission. There are so many passages of Scripture, whether it's directly stated or implied in a story, that point to this being wrong. It places God in service to man instead of the other way around. That I do these things so that way God can serve me. So that way I can be healthy. So that way I can be wealthy. So that way I can be comfortable. Right? It teaches that you pray and give so you get more in return. I love this quote from David Jones. It says this, Simply put, if the prosperity gospel is true, grace is obsolete, God is irrelevant, and man is the measure of all things. Okay? Okay? Now, we haven't even gotten to the fruit. All we've looked at so far is what? Scripture. And that has done its job. We could stop here and see that this is not something we should go after. But let's keep going. Some of the prophets of this, by the way, as you're filling your library, I want to give you a few names uh, of people that are very, very popular in this. Joel Osteen. Okay? Chris Okodi. Benny Hinn. Robert Tilton. T.D. Jakes, Kenneth Copeland, Joyce Meyer. We can keep going. Anybody? No, I'm just kidding. We can keep going. These are the ones that are wearing sheep's clothing. What does it say? Beware of them. Well, that's not, why would you call people out like that? The Bible says that I'm supposed to. That if you're claiming to follow Jesus, look at who Jesus was most harsh with. It wasn't the sinners. It was those that were claiming the name of God the Father. Those are those people. So let's ask the next question. Why so sheepish? Why is this so appealing? I don't think this is very hard. Who doesn't want to be healthy and wealthy? That sounds pretty good. I got to go to church. Oh, don't worry. If you give to me, call now. Oh, I can feel the spirit flowing. I hear the phones ringing. Right? Televangelism. Whoo, man. Blessings are coming. Where's that money going? Their bank account. Who doesn't want to be healthy and wealthy? Man, I'll give to that. We do it anyways. We, have, we buy health insurance. Why? So we can be healthy. We have the nice stuff and the nice home. Not just the blanket, the heated blanket. Right? 
And here's the dangerous argument that I was talking about earlier. This is the ignorant ar- argument that comes not out of studying Scripture. Surely God doesn't want us to be poor, does he? God loves us. How could a God of love not want me to be safe and warm, healthy? That, sound, that doesn't sound like a bad argument, right? Like, oh, God's loving. He's a father. He wouldn't want me to be sad. I'm sorry. It'll take you about 10 pages to realize that that's not true. That God puts us to the test because in the refiner's fire, we are proven to be stronger. That Paul is saying, when I am weak, then I am strong. That God would not remove the thorn from my flesh. Why? Because it made me stronger. Why? Because it made me rely on Jesus instead of my own understanding. You see how it doesn't take long? And why do so many people follow this? Because they don't know the truth. They're more, they're more excited about being entertained. And I'm just going to trust what the guy up on the, st- on the stage says because he has a degree. My friends, please don't believe anything I say. Study it for yourself. I'm just here trying to direct you. And, and while I'm trying to be faithful and, and, and communicate the truth to you, even the Bible says, test it all. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21, test it all. So why is this so serious? It's like the dessert in boot camp. You get to the end of the line. Where do they put the, the dessert? At the very end of the line. And who's standing right next to the dessert? The drill instructor. But man, that dessert, notice that he's not standing next to the Brussels sprouts. He's standing where? The pie. While he eats some. Trust me, you don't want to touch that pie. This makes our faith in God transactional instead of transformational. The Bible warns against wealth, in particular, the love and pursuit of it. I actually read this passage to you the last time we were together. Matthew chapter 6, 19 through 24. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And as we fast forward, it says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And if you remember, that word money is actually the word mammon. What is mammon? Wealth regarded as an evil influence or false object of worship and devotion. All of this says, how do you know you're doing it right if you're healthy and wealthy? So what's the fruit that it's producing? Covetousness, jealousy, greed, Does any of that sound like what we're supposed to be about? If we look at the rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 10, if you look at Luke chapter 12, 13 through 15, one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Paul talks about often about being content. Jesus in Matthew 10, 22 says, you will be hated for my name's sake. None of that sounds like what the prosperity gospel is promising. It's producing selfishness instead of selflessness. It produces greed instead of generosity. It produces covetousness instead of contentment. That's the fruit. None of that sounds like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so what does it say? Get away from there. Don't grab that dessert. The drill instructors say, if they grabbed that, they would always say, don't worry, I'll get those calories back. Oh, that was, a, that was a scary thing. Don't touch it. It makes it about you. And we could keep doing this. There's legalism, which means you're saved by works. Pelagianism says that you can attain perfection without grace on your own. Universalism says that all paths lead to Jesus and lead to heaven. That his death covered everybody. It doesn't matter what you believe. Buddha is technically another name for Jesus. And so as long as you're nice, you'll end up there. That it, there's no shortage of these heresies. And what did I just do? Everything that I just did, you can do. Everything that I just did. No, I didn't go to seminary. It doesn't matter. 
My, our students can do this. I've had this same stack of books just like this in front of them, and we've talked through all of them. And I've equipped them with a digital tool where all of this is concise into one website. It's a concordance website with commentaries called Blue Letter Bible. And you know what I love? I love that on a Sunday morning and on a Wednesday night, I see kids with their phones out. And it's not because they're scrolling through Instagram. And this is not a lie. Your students in this church have Blue Letter Bible open while we're doing Bible studies. I'm trying to equip you to be able to do this. Teach, give a man a fish, you'll feed him for a day. Teach him to fish, you'll feed him for a life. I'm trying to teach you to fish. You have to know the truth. Remember, the best defense is a good offense. Notice that what we did in each heresy, what did we use? Scripture. It's the same thing that Jesus did in the wilderness when he was tempted. What did he respond with? As it is written. And here's what's so funny. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, he's quoting Deuteronomy. What does he say? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's what you live by, is his word. As he's being tempted in the wilderness about food when he hasn't eaten in 40 days. Some of us would give in after 40 minutes. He says, all I need is scripture, because it helps me. Your only offensive tool in the, in the uh, in, in the armor of God is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. Your only offensive, uh, offensive tool is Scripture. That's why the best defense is a good offense. And we could go on and on. Jesus says in, in John 17, sanctify them in truth. Your Word is truth. That we should delight in the law of the Lord and meditate on it day and night. Uh, I was asked early on why my dirty laundry is hanging up on the stand. It's not dirty. <laughs> why is this stack of books here? These are all tools. This is a concordance that, that can show you what the original languages said. This is a Bible atlas that can actually show you what it looked like, what you're reading about looked like. Um, we don't use cubits anymore. So if you come across that word, you might not know what that means. This is a survey. This kind of gives you the overarching tale of the Old Testament and New Testament. This is a Bible dictionary. Maybe you come across a word that you don't understand. You can look it up in here. These are different versions of study Bibles. This is called an ancient faith study Bible, where you can actually see what the ancient church fathers said about those passages. This is a study Bible by Charles Spurgeon, where you can hear what he, his actual sermon notes on these passages. This is a commentary that goes deeper into the context around the, study, the scripture that you're studying. All, this is a book on inerrancy. This is a book that actually teaches how we can trust that Scripture is completely true and without error. Both of these books, these actually teach you practically how to study the Bible, that when you sit down with your Bible, it actually shows you what you're supposed to do. And all of this is concise and put into one website called Blue Letter Bible that I've actually show, showed our students how to use. Week after week, I have them use it. Then maybe you're not into reading. By the way, maybe you're not into reading the Bible, Listen to it. Get an audio Bible. A lot of people back in Jesus' day were illiterate. So the only way they got Scripture was by listening to someone read it to them. There's no excuse. Join a Bible study. It's in your bulletin, but this is actually um, our, our men's ministry. Our, our goal for fellowship in 2024 is to have an active uh, English men's ministry. And I know we meet up every quarter for breakfast, but we're going to be meeting every single week on Thursday mornings at 6.30 at Denny's to look at scripture, to get closer as men, all generations from 14 years up. All those Isaacs need Abrahams. That on, that on February 10th, we're launching this, this ministry called Frontline, um, and that name comes from 1 Corinthians 15, 58, where, where we're, it's talking about that we should stand firm, that men should be the front line of ministry in the church and in the home. Where do I learn that? Scripture. You need to be in an active Bible study so that way you know what the truth is and it, it can mobilize you in the right ways. That you don't get caught up in opinions, but you treasure truth. Otherwise, you're going to fall to the wolves in sheep's clothing every time and you won't even know. You won't even see it coming. You won't even realize you've been defeated because you don't know what the truth is. Know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Charles Spurgeon, I'm going to close with this. It says, It is God's word that made us. 
He spoke you into existence. It is God, God's word that, that made us. Is it any wonder that his word should su- sustain us? Let me pray. Father, I thank you for this morning an opportunity to look at the importance of studying your word that it should be written on our hearts, that it should be the number one thing that we value because it's your word, your truth, that all scripture is God-breathed. That as we study it, we know the voice of our shepherd and we can determine the lies. God, give us your word. Give us a desire and a hunger for more of it. And as we have questions, give us the answers. Help us to test everything and not be content until we get to see you face to face. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all so much for coming. If, if you would like to see, don't steal these, by the way. If you would like to see what these books are, or maybe talk with me about these, I'd love to talk with you more about it. Uh, come on up and I'd love to show you this. And also, men, look in your, women too, we have an extremely active women's ministry as well. Don't leave today without, without committing to studying God's Word. Thank you guys so much for coming.